Uh, I would like to begin with acknowledging with the deepest respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria stands, and the Esquimalt, Songhees, and Wasinish peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. I would also like to acknowledge that our lecture this evening is made possible through the generous support of the Orion Fund that is facilitated through the Office of the Dean of Fine Arts. Uh, our guest this evening, UVic alumni, Kelly Jazvac, is a Canadian artist based in Montreal, Canada. She is also part of a plastic pollution research team called the Synthetic Collective, which includes scientists, artists, art historians, philosophers, and writers. The work of this research group is highly influential on Jazvac's artistic practice. She currently has exhibitions at the Musée d'Art Contemporain in Montreal, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and forthcoming at the Art Museum at the University of Toronto. Her recent exhibitions include the Eli and Edith Broad Museum in East Lansing, Rzhodowski Castle, CCA in Warsaw, and Fierman Gallery in New York. Her work has been written about in National Geographic, EFLUX Journal, or EFLUX Journal, Hyperallergic, Art Forum, The New Yorker, Canadian Art Magazine, and The Brooklyn Rail. Her collaborative art and science research has been published in scientific journals, including Nature Reviews, GSA Today, and Science of the Total Environment. Please join me in welcoming Kelly Jazak. Silence, awesome. Kelly. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. This is so, I mean, it's such a, a strange new reality to, to see all these wonderful people popping up as little squares. Hi, Cedric. Hi, Verena. Hi, Doug. <laughs> so, so nice to see people, um, even uh, as just a little digital representation of yourself. Um, I, fi I find myself smiling inappropriately when I talk about serious plastic pollution issues, just because I'm so happy to see people in, in, that I like in the Zoom platform. But anyway, I'll try and get serious a bit. Um, I will share my screen. Uh, I like an active chat, so really don't hold back unless you are a troll who has just walked in. Everyone else, uh, please use the chat. Um, I also like the one kind of nice thing about the Zoom thing, other than connecting across great distances, is the link potential. Like if you have a link or something that you think is relevant to the conversation, you, you just go ahead and plunk it in that chat because that's a really nice way to um, just uh, build the archive of the discussion. So I'm ready to go. Okay, so see okay, everybody? How come I can't see? I can't see anybody. Huh. Hang on a sec. Um, so if you wanted to see more, you could press view in the top uh, upper right hand corner and switch it to side by side gallery if you wanted to see more people. Oh, okay. I see. I see. Um, for some reason, it's blocking me from that. Okay. Um, just so you know, I can't see you. I can see my slides um, and I can't see the chat. So Jordan, maybe you can shout out if there's something relevant in the chat that I should talk about. I will try. Okay. Oh, wait, hang on. I can now have, we have just appeared. Okay, here we go. We're in business. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, you got the chat as well. I got the chat. Um, okay, I still can't see participants' faces, but I guess, I guess that'll have to do. I got the chat. Okay, that's my lifeline. Um, okay, I wanted to start with a photo of my MFA thesis work at uh, UVic which I, um, I feel like I pulled it out of the vault for this special occasion here. Um, and I won't say too much about it because there's kind of lots of things I want to talk about today, but just um, I, I had such a lovely time uh, working on my MFA at Victoria. And now that I'm running a sculpture program at Concordia, I, I really can appreciate what incredible sculpture facilities uh, they were. So, um, sculptors at Victoria take advantage of that. Uh, I didn't even know how good it was when I was there. I also met my future partner. Um, there he is there modeling uh, this, my thesis show, trying to make it look extra big by standing far at the back, which is a really useful photo trick. Um, well, thanks Cliff for posting oh, my website, which is under construction. Yeah, project, <laughs> exactly. 
Um, I thought I would start with an anecdote because um, it relates very much to how I think about my practice and it will also relate to uh, what I'd like to talk about in the MFA seminar tomorrow. And it's an anecdote I read about in a book called The Secret Lives of Color by Cassia St. Clair. And the story, um, the story, as the story goes, uh, Edward Burns Jones, the pre-Raphaelite painter, was sitting at lunch in 1881, and one of his guests uh, came, to the, came to lunch and was recounting the story of just having been at the paint maker's warehouse where he witnessed a, a mummy, an Egyptian mummy's body being ground up to make uh, mummy paint. And at that time, uh, at that, until that moment, Edward Burns Jones hadn't connected his mummy brown paint with the actual pillaging of Egyptian bodies um, from Egypt. And he had such a kind of uh, freak out at that connection um, that he, he immediately left lunch and made this kind of burial for, his, for all of his mummy brown paint in his collection, which he was using at that time. And that kind of, opening of the eyes to the violence behind materials that might be a part of one's art practice is a really um, driving principle for, for how I work. And so I'm gonna start with that and we can kind of loop back to it as we go. Um, that drive is also in a roundabout way led to uh, the founding and participation of this collective called the Synthetic Collective. Um, which, uh, as Rick mentioned in my intro, has become a really influential part of my artistic practice, but also um, in my life as a citizen. As a group, we have uh, published scientific papers, and it uh, delights me to see uh, artists and art historians' names uh, on the same lists, on, on the same papers as scientists. And it equally delights me to see uh, scientists' names on museum walls. Uh, and these works are at MoMA right now. And uh, Patricia Corcoran, one of my key collaborators, name is on the wall in MoMA. Oh, uh, should I be admitting people? I keep getting these notices that say admit. We'll do it. Don't worry about We're that. on it, Kelly. Sorry. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, good. All right, back to business here. Um, so that's kind of the preamble, and now I'll go into some artworks. I should also mention that um, in terms of your attention and Zoom uh, ability to stay present in a Zoom session, I have scheduled an eight minute video at the halfway point and an eight minute video at the end. So uh, if you're getting tired, know that there's a video coming up. Um, but I'll start with this project, which was kind of the, the first major thing I did after my MFA at Victoria. And I had uh, put a proposal into the Toronto Sculpture Garden and was accepted and I was thrilled. It, it was the first time I had um, this kind of major funding to do a project that I had envisioned. And for that project, I uh, used the money to buy this pretty beat up uh, 1997 Pontiac Sunfire. I made some very slight modifications to it, um, filled in some cracks, re-sculpted some uh, head, head rest things. I know a lot about cars, uh, not so much. And I then recovered that 90, uh, 1997 Pontiac to make it uh, cloaked in the skin of a current model of Porsche 911. And I used uh, an advertising medium, which I'm sure everyone is pr quite familiar with right now, it's very common in galleries for titles on the wall, but it's also um, a very dominant advertising form where basically a, an ad is printed on a sticker and that sticker can be shown, uh, can be adhered to all sorts of places, including crumbling brick walls and concrete and the like. So I should show these here. So this is this installed in the garden. A uh, kind of trompe l'oeil photo of uh, the hubcap, so this, this does look 3D in this photo, but it is in fact a 2D image of an actual Porsche that I uh, advertised on Kijiji if someone, if a Porsche owner would let me come and take pictures of their car. Um, and lots of people were very <laughs> willing to let me come and take pictures of their Porsche. And so I used that, uh, use those images to develop uh, these kind of decals for the part of the visual effect. And I was, I, 
really enjoyed where you could see the relief of the thing that it actually was uh, and the skin on top of the thing that the object was aspiring to be. And maybe a, a kind of pivotal moment in my practice was through the process of uh, realizing this. Um, when it came to covering the inside of the, of the Pontiac to look like a Porsche, the advertising medium started to fail because it wasn't designed to do the thing I was trying to get it to do. And uh, the ad company I was working with who was letting me like kind of be right there on the floor with them to reduce costs was just like absolutely aghast at this that they, they thought it was so unprofessional and, and not what they were supposed to do because of course an advertisement is not supposed to draw attention to the medium. The message is the, is the main thing. Um, and so they sort of backed away and said, you know what, you do the inside, we don't wanna do this. This is not up to our quality. And I had this amazing time using this material, forcing it to do things that it really didn't wanna do. And in all these kind of places where the bubbles started to come up and pucker um, really started to get interesting to me. Now in that process, um, some mistakes were made. So here's kind of an action shot where you can get a sense of actually how tricky it is. If you can imagine um, you know, how easy it is to get some duct tape stuck to itself when you take it off the roll, imagine this uh, 12 foot long by four feet long sticker. And so one of my sides that was printed, so this is like in the process of it getting um, adhered to the car, uh, an error was made and so uh, the result ended up with um, the owner just saying, oh, don't, don't worry, Kelly, just throw it in the dumpster in the back. And so I took it out to the dumpster in the back, which was this pretty magical dumpster filled with all these colors, filled with all these ads. Um, and I asked at that point, like, whoa, do you want, do you want what's in there? And they said, well, if, as long as you take away um, any identifiable logos, logos, et cetera, then sure, it's all yours. And so I started this intense salvaging practice from that moment on um, of using this material. Um, putting, yeah, it is very plastic car model -y. Oh, I should have put in this other photo. While I was there, a person who had a fake Lamborghini actually pulled in. It was like a kit car, like a kind of make your own Lamborghini. Anyway, that's another story. Um, so in addition to just like simply all the, the colors, every color of the rainbow being in the, the dumpster, there was also these things that started to catch my attention in terms of their evidence or the evidence that they offered. Ooh, Plexi, that's a plexiglass dumpster. That is um, a hot commodity right now, actually. Um, so I mean, a lot of the things I was collecting might look like this, like this is some used vinyl that's already been displayed. But then there was other weird things like this that um, I almost felt like I shouldn't even have my hands on. Um, and so what this says is, um, after a volatile year for markets in 2007, we look forward to 2008 with some optimism. As the concerns of the last 12 months begin to unwind, there will be opportunities later in the year to invest in the bombed out sectors. And this was some kind of like internal marketing thing for some kind of, investment situation I'm not I'm not really sure um, but what struck me at the time was what ended up happening happening in 2008 when the market really seriously crashed um, and here's this kind of whoops, whoops, whoops. Oh, no. sorry here's this kind of delusional sales pitch um, that I you know find in the trash afterwards like in 2009 2010 uh, other strange moments where like just a picture of the earth and someone's written garbage on it, like just kind of strange things that if I were to make it as art, it would be so didactic and literal. And yet here it is in the garbage as is straight from the culture that produced it. Um, people started leaving me things. I found these outside my office door one day that um, a 3M uh, D installer had taken off the side of a building and had left them for me thinking I would like them. And they, uh, I didn't feel I needed to do anything else uh, to them. They, they had the, the promise and shine and color palette of a sales pitch, and yet they were shrunken and uh, wrinkly and used looking at the same time. Ah, got no. Sorry, I swear I've used Zoom before. There's, for whatever reason, it's just a little glitchy. Anyway, 
I swear I live on something. Huh. In any case, um, and then I also made pieces like this, where instead of using things exactly as I found, I would collage them together by looking at other things that I was trying to replicate. Uh, this is a more current shot of what my studio looks like. Um, I'm now focusing a bit more on billboards. So I've, I'm trying to get rid of um, the adhesive vinyl in my life just because the level of toxicity is so much higher. And I'll talk to that later, but um, I'm finding this is just a little easier to off gas and control the fumes. Now I'm gonna get into some plastic pollution stuff, um, but I'll kind of weave in and out of, of art and, and this as I go. Uh, so what you're looking at is uh, a representation of the five oceanic gyres. So these red places here depicted in the ocean are where uh, micro and ma macro plastics are accumulating in larger quantities. And I would be very surprised if anyone in this room hadn't heard of this before. Um, but what I want to point out with this map is this additional piece of information, which is um, in the scientific paper, they've mapped, um, how have they labeled it here? Plastic waste available to enter ocean in 2010 in a million tons. So right here, they're assigning a dot to every country that has a larger amount of uh, plastic waste uh, entering their oceans from that location. Um, so if you kind of look at this at face value and uncritically, you might see um, a really good opportunity for the blame game. Whereas Canada doesn't look so bad um, compared to other areas. But of course, what this map doesn't show us is which countries are paying which other countries to take their unrecyclable waste. And in Canada, less than 10% of plastics is actually recycled, um, which is a pretty staggering low amount, given that that's been um, kind of the main source of consumer action um, that's been championed for so long. But uh, what's really being revealed now is how uh, recycling is, is literally a lie. It's not working and it's not enough to, to change the course of where we're headed. Now in 2013, um, I met this person here, Patricia Corcoran, and we met uh, because I went to see a talk by Charles Moore, who's a plastics pollution activist that I'm interested in. And through the process of salvaging all this plastic from these graphics uh, companies, um, well, first of all, I was astounded by the quantity I was able to acquire really quickly and really easily. And then secondly, I was at a, a residency in Banff and I had brought, you know, not, not a huge amount of vinyl, but enough amount of vinyl. Uh, and my studio stank. There was such a high degree of off-gassing happening from this material that I, I was getting, um, I, like, well, I was literally getting high from it. And I was confused because I read my material safety data sheets and didn't see anything about getting high from this material or even any recommended personal protective equipment for the material at that time. So I, again, I was really surprised. And that experience, that very bodily experience of feeling uh, perturbed in my own body by this material I was working with, led me down this research hole about plastics pollution and what it is chemically, what it means in the environment, what it means for our bodies. And out of that interest, I saw Charles Moores was giving a talk and I showed up at this talk. Um, and at the end of it, I went and figured out who was the person that invited Charles Moores to present. And that in fact was Patricia Corcoran. And um, I contacted her that day and said, hey, if you ever wanna collaborate, let me know. And she did like the next week, get back to me and say, yes, actually. Um, Charles Moore has told her about, and he talked about it in his, his talk, in fact, about this uh, substance he was seeing uh, on a beach in Hawaii. And he felt that a geologist should study it because he thought it was a really interesting uh, new geological phenomenon. Um, and Patricia said, well, do you wanna go and work with me to, to study that because I don't have any funding and I can't do any field work by myself. That's a, a kind of technical requirement of um, a field work for the school. And I said, sure. And, uh, and off we went. And it's been this kind of amazing relationship ever since. 
Um, but before I go any further about the Hawaii story, I want to talk about Ron and Noni Sanford. And they were our local guides and local activists when we arrived, and they were really interested in uh, getting the truth out there of what this substance was that Charles Moore had found. Let's go take a sip of water. And so Charles Moore was under the impression that lava was erupting from volcanoes, uh, washing down to the shore and fusing with plastic pollution debris that was coming up from the North Pacific gyre above Hawaii. Um, and because of that, uh, he felt that lava itself was forming this new substance, but it was also this amazing example of nature taking care of herself. Now, Ron and Noni Sanford uh, knew otherwise. They, they literally knew that was not the case. And they were struggling with the public dissemination of this idea that nature was taking care of herself because they as local activists and volunteers of the Hawaiian Wildlife Fund have personally removed literally tons of plastic waste from their local beaches. Uh, here's a picture of Ron with his truck and a winch that he would go around and pick up these massive uh, conglomerates of fishing rope. Now, um, when we got there, further study was found. And in fact, it was not, it was very clear there was not volcanic activity that was causing this substance. It was humans, humans having campfires on the beach in Hawaii. Um, and from talking to Ron and Noni, uh, from studying the site, we published this paper uh, in GSA Today, an anthropogenic marker horizon in the future rock record. And we proposed that this substance, because it was a combination of plastic merging with denser materials, actually had a high potential to be buried and preserved in the rock record as a future fossil. Um, and that story, that paper got a lot of uh, recognition, both um, with environmentalists, but also in this whole other way, which I'll describe in a little bit. Um, and after that, I was, I was kind of inspired to just write this, this short kind of essay called Noni Knows, where it just, it struck me as so, um, I know important to say that the local knowledge knew what was happening uh, before science came in with its authority to say so. Um, and I, I mean, I believe in science. I am, I think science is extremely important, but I also think that science needs to evolve. Um, I mean, just like art needs to evolve. And so for me, um, flagging what Noni knew uh, was a really important part of the afterlife of this project. If this subject is of interest at all to you in terms of, um, well, in, in, in any way, um, I would strongly recommend this reading um, by Max Liberon, How Plastic is a Function of Colonialism. And what I, what I don't want as a kind of takeaway from my practice is like, oh, she's into upcycling, that, that's cool, recycling. Um, to me, plastic is this small component of this much larger metaphor of colonialism, capitalism, and consumerism. Um, it's a symptom of this very sick system. Um, so for me, that's where, that's the thing I wanna talk about, um, how this symptom shows signs of a larger cause. And, Max really gets down to that uh, really beautifully in this essay. And maybe the more special part of this is that it's published in Teen Vogue. Um, so if nothing else, reading this and knowing that 12 year old uh, girls are also reading this essay is a really kind of powerful experience. Uh, and it makes me feel really accountable to younger people. Uh, another very strange thing that's come about from this project is um, these ethical questions that are raised by it. And it also relates for me very clearly back to uh, human propensity to uh, in uh, colonial capitalist and consumerist pursuits. But pretty soon after the article was published, the scientific article was published, which we really saw as a kind of warning sign, uh, there was a big interest in plastic glomerate as a potential new resource. 
And so I was getting sort of strange things, asking for image permissions. Uh, I still get strange emails uh, pretty much on a weekly basis, asking for image permissions for various things. And often they are trying to say, hey, this is a great new thing we can manufacture uh, as part of the future, future material index. Uh, this email was kind of an early email that both sort of floored Patricia and I, where they were suggesting that, uh, I should get the language right, that plastic conglomerates color palette, like the color palettes found in those plastic conglomerate samples would be the uh, inspirational color palette trends for 2015, 16. And this kind of, uh, well, it blew both our minds. It was such a, an eye opener um, that this, this horrific yet fascinating thing um, could be proposed as a trending design element. So anyway, um, and I'd like to kind of touch on that tomorrow in the MFA seminar. Uh, of the MFAs can probably tell where I'm getting at from the questions I sent and the readings I sent in advance, but I, mean, I look forward to discussing that more. Um, and just some examples of plastic glomerates shown in an art context. And so I really like the idea of an object, a video, an image, a piece of text, how it can infect and influence a gallery space in a new way. Um, that the presence of something in a constellation then changes how you see the thing next to it. And I really like using these plastic glomerates as that kind of function in a gallery space. Uh, here's another setup. This exhibition was called Rock Record. And here's just a, a sand sample. If you're kind of struggling to picture how humans making campfires are causing plastic glomerate, plastic glomerate. Uh, this is a sand sample from the beach where the study was uh, took place. So you can get a sense just from that pile that if you had any type of fire whatsoever, you were gonna burn plastic. That's you know that doesn't mean people are throwing tires into a fire on a beach. This means uh, that plastic is already there. And maybe one other thing I'll say in the context of this show is that Hawaii has no petrochemical industry. Um, and what uh, certainly I feel I saw, but again, I did, you know, no scientific study was took place as part of that as to the origin of the plastics on the beach, but certainly I saw Canadian fishing tags or uh, packaging with Russian or Korean on them. There was a really big sense that the debris that was washing up on this beach uh, was from a global source, not because locals are mismanaging their own waste. And that goes back to that scientific graph I showed at the beginning where there's, there's some really uh, murky ethical terrain right now that we have to spend time thinking about what, what means to be home and guest um, in a place, in a planet that's so connected by these uh, currents. Um, now I'm gonna show this exhibition, which, uh, followed kind of right after this project. And I don't normally show this in artist talks, but I'm showing it because there's a video in it, which will give you kind of a little zoom break for a moment. Um, it's called Recent Landscapes. Um, this, this, was, this object here was in the front window of the gallery space, which was a little hard to see. So I kind of reproduced re, uh, it here, but basically you'd be standing with that object at your back if you're looking into the show here. And I was very interested in this exhibition of depicting moments through salvage plastics and images and display techniques of where there was a, a kind of relationship between humans and the, the immediate environment and these synthetic uh, products, which are everywhere. Um, and I, I'm probably, if you're not uh, reading about plastics every day, when I say plastics, you probably think about things like uh, water bottles and toothbrushes, but in fact, uh, petrochemicals are everywhere. You're probably sitting on plastic right now. Um, I'd be very surprised if there wasn't a uh, petrochemical coating on whatever you're sitting on right now, even if it's wood uh, that is made out of plastic. It is in pharmaceuticals. It is in chewing gum. It is in every type of new construction within a house. It is so pervasive and in so many times we don't think it's there, but it is. Uh, so I'm very interested in that, that fusion of living with petrochemicals in such a bodily way. 
some pieces from the show, which all have images of nature, but then also other kind of allusions to being, beings inside. And titles is maybe another talk, but also we'll get into that later. Uh, a couple of plastic glomerates were displayed as part of the exhibition. Um, oops. A photo from a walk in 2014, which now everything just sort of seems like it's about COVID, but before there was COVID, um, I feel like you could put this kind of thing in a gallery space without it being about COVID, but I guess that's changed. And at the very back, uh, there was this video. I'll just circle it crudely there, uh, which I'd like to play for you now. And the video is also called Recent Landscapes. And I, it came about through a very different way of thinking through what this entanglement of body and being with petrochemicals uh, and the environment. Uh, there's nothing very, there's nothing plastic like in the video at all, but it came about from talking uh, to a family friend who uh, is a professional musician and has played for a long time. And she was talking about, uh, uh, Marie Peebles, she's just an amazing woman. woman. Um, and she was talking about something that she was noticing in orchestras where younger musicians coming in could play very quickly and with a lot of speed and technical accuracy. But she, as a trained musician, could hear a emotional um, lack, like an inability to capture an emotional expression in the work. And vice versa, she could hear that in the in the older generation of musicians, an ability to really uh, capture an emotion through playing of the music, but not having the ability to play as fast and precise as that younger generation. And so I was really interested in that uh, dichotomy. And so I made this little video. Hey, Kelly. Yeah. Real quick, did you make it so the sound would play through your share when you shared your screen? I did do that. Okay, um, cool. If it sounds bad, just put it, tell me in the chat, I guess. Yep, yep, I'll let you know. Okay, um, and feel free to just, well, actually, I can't see you anyway, but feel free to turn off your uh, camera if this will be a break for you, because this will be, as you can see, about nine minutes, um, and there's some, there's some interesting things here now looking back. The first thing is it gets really zoomy. Uh, so I, I haven't experienced this on Zoom before. So this might be an interesting kind of added quality to it. But for this piece, I simply asked um, Marie Guelinas, who is a cellist with the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, to pick a piece that she felt was not uh, difficult to play in terms of speed, but difficult to play in terms of emotional tenor. And then at the same time, I asked uh, six, uh, six younger people who were learning how to play the cello to come and try to learn by videotaping her through the process of looking. So here, here's what that resulted in.
I'm just responding to Beth's comments in the chat there. That that one, uh, the one young musician who was really focused on the feet the whole time. I asked her afterwards, you know, what, why, why the feet? Um, and for her, that was like a really disjunction, a, a really big disjunction between trying to capture the feeling but having to be beholden to the timing and time signature of the piece. Like, you know, how do you reconcile those two things, especially while you're still performing live? Like, this, I just have so much, uh, so much respect for musicians and what they do. Um, okay, so, oh, thank you for the nice, nice chats in there. Hopefully that was kind of a, a Zoom chill experience for you. Um, as always, I'm talking too long and I'm mindful of time. And there's one other video that is a very different musical experience that I wanna show you. Um, so I might just kind of talk about the really important things here and then uh, fast forward through a couple of things and we can always go back if there's questions, but um, I just have a little prepared thing. So that, so that show Recent Landscapes had these themes in it that I think are in the video, but are also in other parts of the work. And uh, I've listed them here, looking for the animate and what has been deemed inanimate by dominator culture, listening carefully to the land and its beings drawing energy from a connection with the land, not the exploitation of it, cross-generational respect, dialogue, and teachings, the slow pace of deep learning, and acting with humility and care. And these, these are not new ideas, and white people certainly didn't invent any of them. And I'm trying very hard to be a less oblivious white person. And uh, these two books that I've read recently in that process um, just kind of well, not kind of, they shake me to my core. Uh, they both have these uh, depictions. Um, they're both, both kind of, uh, fiction of a white obliviousness causing true harm. Um, and there's a, there is a reckoning and a shame and an acceptance and a moving on and productively from that that I am really invested in. So I just, um, I'm not saying that these books inspired that show. Those show. That show was long ago, but I'm just saying this is part of that ongoing work of reducing my own Beta Samosaki Simpson calls it white obliviousness in the book. And I, I thought that was just such a perfect kind of thing. Like, yes, that's, that's a good way of putting it. Um, I think the show I'm going to speed through is about some white obliviousness, but I'll just show you pictures and then if there's interest in the Q&A, uh, we can kind of zoom back to it. Um, but this is a very recent show uh, that just closed uh, last week, in fact, in New York at a gallery I work with there, Fearman. Um, and I was given a, a museum banner from the Art Museum at U of T. And um, it was of a painting by Lucas Cranach, the elder. Oh, I'm talking about it. I said I wasn't going to talk about it. Okay, I'm just going to show the pictures. <laughs> Here we go. Um, oh, no, I, I have to talk about this. Okay. Um, so I was given this banner of this painting. And at the same time, I'm reading all this eco theory about how this moment of uh, this Judeo Christian origin story of uh, humans being, uh, oh, thank you, Megan. Okay, you're gonna hear about it. <laughs> uh, so I'm reading all this eco theory that draws from a Judeo-Christian origin story. So Adam and Eve getting kicked out of the art, uh, the Garden of Eden as this essentially um, anti-feminist, anti-nature origin story, story upon which these cultures are now built. Uh, so here, nature and Eve are working in cahoots to deceive Adam who eats the apple and then they get kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Um, and that's a pretty intense origin story when you really take a moment to think about uh, what that's fostered now in our current society, right? Um, and that is so different from uh, many other origin stories of the world and including a huge difference between many indigenous origin stories. Uh, so I was very interested in that. And then I was also interested in this kind of factoid I learned from reading about Lucas Cranach the Elder. Um, and he was a businessman. Um, wow, he was a profitable painter in his time in Renaissance Germany. And he had this studio where um, there was such a demand for paintings that there was some kind of templates applied. And so one of those templates was a painting in the eye 
And I really related to the story because I feel like I did this as a young art student myself when I was trying to paint a realistic eye, how you put um, a reflection in the eye to make it look realer. Um, but what was being noticed in ver various art historical accounts is that the studio assistants were not noticing when the figure was outside or inside that they were painting. And regardless, they were painting the reflection in the eyeball as if the human was inside. So here's like this super tiny little piece of evidence of a human forgetting their own connectivity to the landscape in which their body uh, depends upon. And this is, this is everywhere in Cranach's work. And I just kind of got obsessed with it. And that could be like a whole other lecture of just all these paintings where um, outdoor scenes with indoor eyeball reflections. And if you know what I'm talking about, here's just a little graphic off the net that sort of shows if you're inside what a, a kind of cartoon of a window might look like reflected in your eyes. There's another one. Oh. And the, the internet databases now are just insane. Like you can get so close to paintings and see their surface. Oh, wow. Anyway, that was a fun trip. Um, and so for the exhibition, I was kind of taking all of these, these ideas of, of an alienation um, through a, a dominator culture origin story um, and trying to flip that a bit, take out some of the power of what it was and represent it. Um, so Adam became chairs with some careful thinking about where a human body might line up now in the new format. Um, and Eve became transformed into this other kind of creature. Um, and the stag got an angry eyebrow in a place that just sort of accentuates. Um, and maybe I won't talk about some just historical things. Um, but this relates back to accountability of materials. Well, I'm going to move along. It also relates to taking things from trees that you shouldn't, um, like apples. Um, I'm going to, let me just check the time. Okay. I'm going to skip ahead from the, for the chemical talk. So if anybody's interested in about <laughs> polyvinyl chloride <laughs> and the chemistry of it, we can talk later, but for now we'll just, we'll save that for the MFA seminar. We can come back to this. Um, and all the hypocrisies and conflicts of interest involved in the selling of petrochemical products. Um, and, and of course, COVID's role in that also terrifying. Um, but again, you know, for another day. Um, I'm very interested in scale as an artist and someone who identifies as a sculptor, even though um, I barely make sculpture in a lot of ways, it's a very thin sculpture. Um, and I just wanted to do this, this UVic plug about the scale and the difficulty of comprehending the scale. Um, there's a researcher at UVic who had just published this study where he was trying to quantify the amount of microfibers in the air. And when he would take his samples, he would take, put them in a Ziploc bag and write on a Sharpie, write with a Sharpie the sample number. And then when he then went to count the samples, he noticed that just the act of writing with a Sharpie on the bag produced enough microfibers to contaminate his sample inside. Like, what? <laughs> like how do you, <laughs> how do you even begin to understand the scale of the pollution and what that means for our bodies? Um, in the scientific writing that I'm constantly reading, the harm, th this phrase comes up all the time, likely underestimated. The harm, the contamination, the pollution is likely underestimated than is represented in this study. Uh, so this is, this is serious stuff for literally uh, the, sur the survival of our species. Um, 85 quadrillion microfibers are released in wastewater annually in homes in the US and Canada from synthetic fibers. I have no idea how much 85 quadrillion is, but obviously that's another scale that's just absolutely impossible to understand. And that scale is echoed right alongside with the money involved. So the, the billions, literally billions of dollars at play here, uh, again, are beyond my ability to understand. Um, and so scale was something I think about a lot. Uh, this is a, the piece that's currently up at the Mac in Montreal, and it's made from a salvaged billboard. And scale and understanding in your body uh, is an important part of the work. And I'll just move a little quickly because of time, but 
that gives a sense of the piece. It's dirty. I cleaned it a lot, but it's still dirty. And I think that's something that I'm also really, I know that's something that I'm also really interested in the museum context with this salvage material. More close up. There's a cowboy hat in it. There once was a cowboy, but I just left his hat. And it becomes this kind of walk through in the space. Uh, the curtain itself, I have retailored uh, five times now. And so the Mac was the first time I showed the entire scale of the billboard, which is 80 feet uh, in length. Um, it was actually displayed in Columbus Circle in New York, which just again struck me in terms of my colonial interests, like just like I couldn't have made up a uh, more apropos location for it to come from. Um, and I'm just gonna, so here's another kind of example of this billboard salvaging, uh, reprocessing by hand in order to subvert the power of the image in some way. Um, I like that an other emotional tenors get inflected into the piece by the handwork, the hand stitching as well. So a worried brow perhaps. Uh, see this one is like a pouty, pouty guy, pouty. Uh, this reminds of a, a beautiful piece by Beth too. I should. You should put those JPEGs next to each other one day, Beth, this, this one and a piece of yours that I, I really like. Um, okay, the last thing I'm gonna show is a video. Um, is How is the energy? The video is 10 minutes long. Is there energy for this? Do you wanna, yeah? Okay, I see a thumbs, I think, I see two, I see four thumbs up. Okay, we're doing, we're doing this. <laughs> um, so this video, again, that kind of idea of inserting other uh, other ideas within a constellation of a show that can help expand what's happening in other parts of the space. Um, so this video is called Forward Contamination. Um, I'll just give a quick intro before I play it, but you will probably want some control of your volume, just, to, just so you know, because the volume of it escalates uh, as it plays. Um, and maybe I won't say anything more. I think I'm just gonna play it. Let's just, let's just do it. And please feel free to get comfy and turn off your camera. So there was a treaty put together in 1967 by NASA, the Outer Space Treaty. And in it, they emphasized the need to prevent contamination by Earth on other planets and vice versa other planets contaminating Earth. Since then, a lot of different organizations have put a lot of thought into how we can prevent contamination through the spacecraft that we send to other planets. Since 1975, when they were putting together the Viking probes, which they sent to Mars, they started sterilizing the spacecraft, at least the United States has, through what we call dry heat sterilization. So they'll heat up the spacecraft over 100 degrees Celsius in the hope of killing off any microbes on board However, this technique doesn't work for all instruments because you don't want to heat up sensitive instruments that you're sending to other planets. What about humans? You can't decontaminate a human. We're just bags of microbes. So once you start sending humans to other planets, there's no hope really of keeping these planets immune from our bacteria. What about panspermia? Panspermia. This is this idea that life form can be transferred between planets on asteroids. So when you have an asteroid impact on another planet, it will kick up debris that can then sail through the solar system and impact other worlds. So if you have an impact that hit the Earth, maybe you'll find a microbe from the Earth being blasted to Mars and vice versa. Mars microbes that traveled here on the asteroid. There's some thought maybe even that life on Earth originated from elsewhere. It's possible that we're all alien through panspermia. So life on Earth fell from space? That is scientifically possible, yes. Have humans contaminated planets in the past? Probably. Astrobiologist Chris McKay says that there's life on Mars and we put it there. We do our best to decontaminate these spacecrafts, but you always have a few little persistent bugs sticking around. 
life is adapted to a lot of different extremes. Extremes of radiation, extremes of pressure and temperature. Those are called extremophiles. We find them in the craziest environments all over Earth. In the bottom of the ocean, the driest deserts. We even have sent microbes into space that had them return to Earth and come back to life. It's pretty incredible how adaptable life is. So the chances that we haven't sent any of these resistant bugs to other planets is probably pretty low. Now when you're traveling to another planet, that's a pretty great sterilization source in itself. Even if you didn't do any sterilization on Earth, launching out of the Earth's atmosphere into space, making the months-long journey to another planet, and then entering its atmosphere and landing on the surface which is not as habitable to life as what we have here on Earth, the chances that those critters are going to survive is pretty low. If you have a particularly hardy critter who is inside the spacecraft, or on the bottom of the spacecraft, where they're slightly more protected, then yes, they can survive possibly. Now, since they're in a pretty uninhabitable environment, the chances that they're going to grow and spread and inhabit the world are slim. It would only occur if you were to land them in particularly sensitive areas that might be connected to a larger biosphere that we're not aware of. For example, on Mars, we've recently noted areas that might indicate there is water on the surface for short periods of time, connected possibly to an aquifer under the surface. So NASA has basically said that you can't land in these areas. They're too sensitive. We don't want to contaminate those regions. Or if in the future, the climate of Mars or other planets may change and make them more habitable, spores and critters trapped inside spacecraft could then go on and inhabit these worlds. How does NASA decide what planets are sensitive? There are categories for different planets. NASA has something called the Planetary Protection Office. Does Earth count as a planet? What does this office do? It's the office that's concerned with interplanetary contamination, how we protect other planets from contamination from Earth and vice versa. How do we protect the Earth from contamination from extraterrestrial life? And they've categorized every planet in the solar system under different categories. So you have category one, which is like the moon, places you don't expect there to be life. The regulations you have for sending spacecraft to the moon are a lot different from sending spacecraft to, say, Mars. Mars is a much higher category. And then on Mars itself, there are certain regions that are even higher interest and very, very difficult to explore. So the catch-22 of Mars exploration, you want to find life on Mars, but you don't want to just find life that you've brought from Earth. There are these areas on Mars, but also Europa and Enceladus. Those are moons of Jupiter and Saturn that do have a subsurface ocean. So if you want to drill down through the ice into the ocean that's below, then you have to be sure not to contaminate those potential biospheres. There are different restrictions when you're exploring these areas. If you're an Arthur C. Clarke fan, he wrote 2010 A Space Odyssey, which is sequel to 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's all about Europa. There's a famous quote from there. All these worlds are yours, except Europa. Attempt no landings there. That's loaded. NASA is planning a trip to Europa right now. So if America made the rules, who then enforces them? Well, no one really. There are no space beliefs that make sure all countries are complying. So you mentioned in the 60s when attitudes changed about contamination within space research? I think people started worrying about this as soon as the space age began. But it wasn't until 1967 that NASA actually put this treaty together. The treaty is not just about planetary protection, though. It also deals with the militarization of space, the land rights, so you can't own other worlds in the solar system. You can't buy them. That's also covered by the Outer Space Treaty. Now again, right now it's sort of a moot point, because nobody's trying to do this. It's really hard to fly to another planet, so this treaty might go out the window and people start figuring that out. But an excellent analog is the Antarctic Treaty, which also prevents countries from owning parts of Antarctica and looking for resources there. And so far that's worked out reasonably well. Antarctica was once a forest not that long ago in geological time. What are the differences in how environmental contamination is considered in space as opposed to Earth? It's really hard to get to space. 
there's a huge barrier. On Earth, we're all here, so it's easy to contaminate. But once we start exploring outer space and people want to find these resources and make money on these planets, then unfortunately, I think a lot of these regulations will go out the window, actually. During the Apollo missions, the first four Apollo missions that returned from the moon actually had to go through a decontamination process. We had no idea if there was going to be moon critters or if the astronauts would be contaminated when they came back. So there were these quarantine vehicles they had to live in for days after the return from the moon. After the fourth mission, I think it was the Apollo 14, they got rid of these procedures because they realized they were not bringing back life. But they were still concerned about the back contamination of other worlds on Earth. What would be an extremophile on Earth might be normal on Mars. We'd be extremophiles on Mars. That's an extreme environment to us. Then you have all the other things we produce, like plastics and garbage. What could humans learn from these planetary protection rules when thinking about contamination on Earth? To realize what impact we make. One tiny bug on the spacecraft is enough to cause a problem. We don't want to accidentally kill the only other possible life form in the solar system from our carelessness. We do that all the time on Earth. There's this book by Kim Stanley Robinson, Red Mars. It describes the first human colonization of Mars, where there's this push and pull between those that want to terraform Mars and make it more like Earth, and those that want to keep it as it is, without human contamination. How can you really know how much contamination there is? How much physical and ideological contamination there is? I guess you have I'll stop it there, but I was just letting the, the words uh, do the talking for me. And... Okay, and that's that's the end of my talk. <laughs> uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Kelly. Yep, thank, thank you, Kelly. Um, okay, so that leads us to some questions, comments. Uh, if you do have a question or comment, just write the word question uh, in the chat and I will call on you to unmute yourself and ask right to Kelly herself. Thanks for the nice things in the chat, everyone. That's, that's really sweet, these ways to feel like there's a human presence. <laughs> I don't have a question, but I just have a comment while people are formulating their questions. Um, I, I'm just left with the, you know, for me, the one question that I'm really is resonating in my mind is what, what does come next? You know, what's next? What is our role? What is, what do we do about this? Mm. So I, I think in, in that regard, your your film and your videos were really impactful. Thank you. Um, there's a really beautiful uh, passage in the the Cure for White Ladies book that I referenced there, where um, they talk about the core sample, of course, revealing that there's pollution. Like, you know, why do we even need to take the core sample? We know it's there, um, and that's something that Patricia Corcoran, my collaborator really is now looking to arts and humanities to kind of help with the cultural component of this because it's it's 
it's so political, it's so social, it's so economic. Um, it's, and it's such a beast. <laughs> um, and no, no one thing is going to fix this. And I, I mean, again, I think that's why that Max Luberon article is so important, I think, because it really traces the complexity of what's involved. And I get very frustrated because um, Patricia and I often do these, these public kind of engagement talks. And there's a lot of uh, like literally 12 year olds who are so dialed into the complexity of the issues. And then the parent who's like, well, that's why we recycle. Come on, stop looking at the horror show. Um, and there, there's just this delusion, <laughs> um, especially by older generations, inclu including myself, um, really of what we're accountable for and the action that we really need to step up to. I, I, and it's really a, like a present issue, like we we're just talking about this in class this morning, and we we're talking about how Elon Musk has this uh, prize of a million or a billion dollars. And I mean, it might as well be the same thing, but um, for uh someone to invent a way to capture carbon and it's like well trees it's already being it's already there you don't need to invent something you just have to stop destroying the things that already do that so exactly and that um heather davis calls it techno utopianism techno utopianism i think that's it um and you know here we are in this very moment where you know we're really banking on that vaccine working <laughs> and i hope you know meanwhile the variants are uh are also adjusting quickly. So there's this, this real human hubris we need to, we need to seriously address. Oh, there they are. Uh, Leanne, go ahead. Hi, Kelly. Thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, I'm just wondering if you could talk about some of your, or if you can, <laughs> your research on the current plastic narratives with the pandemic and plastic kind of returning to a, a safety narrative sometimes and some of the other tools like reusable bags are now toxic again. Um, and just thinking about some of the messages that are maybe being lobbied um, and if, how that's shifting your work or how it's connecting? Yes, um, in, in Canada, as soon as the pandemic happened, um, this, uh, oh, bye, John. Oh, sorry, I just see I just see a bye in the chat. Oh, thanks for coming. Um, as, as soon as the pandemic happened, this group called the Coalition of Concerned Manufacturers uh, like just uh, jumped on it like vultures as an opportunity to promote uh, plastics in the petrochemical industry as like a, see, you need plastics uh, for this PPE. Um, now the, I mean, that slide I sort of sped through is this brutal loop we're in right now where there is tons of research showing how plastics and petrochemicals and its affiliated chemicals are destroying uh, ecosystem diversity. And then the other side of that loop is new viruses are propagating because of diminished uh, ecosystem diversity. So here the thing protecting us from the virus is fueling the production of the virus. Um, so that's a, obviously clearly not sustainable. Um, so I think it is important now to be able to see through uh, the think tanks that are have such conflicts of interest in promoting these uh, pro-plastic narratives. I don't know if that helps. That's a it's it's a bummer. Yeah, exactly. And the cost of oil is so low right now that uh, market projections just show a, an absolute uh, boom for plastic production in the next 10 years, um, especially as uh, uh, oil. I mean, we're seeing this in Montreal, for example, where the elimination of uh, of gas powered vehicles in 10 years, like there's just this kind of shifting of like, OK, if that market doesn't want this oil, we'll make a, a new market that does. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Beth. Hey, so uh, can you hear me? I can, yes. Um, hi, Kelly. <laughs> that was so, thank you so much. That was such a delight. Um, I don't know if I have like anything formulated as far as a real question. I just, um, I 
I think there's something surfacing for me around, uh, like around field research, <laughs> like around something in the in the last video, which is the second time I've seen it, and um, something about the gallery um, and the site in which the the sort of hands are operating, um, feeling so, uh, so physically able to change the kind of macro space and think about what, like make, it sort of makes me sound so not coherent, but it sort of makes me feel like um, uh, really um, Im embedded in the field and that the field in terms of the scientific research, but also in terms of the artistic research is not clean, you know, like, and there's something about that as, as a kind of sculptural practice in relation to a scientific practice that's so interesting to me. And I guess the, if there's a question, there's some, it's something about like what, what it's been to work in the scientific field in relation to the sculptural field and the kind of messes that go along the way, like the kind of um, adaptations and changes and like, you know, mistakes that exist along the way. Does that make any sense? I, th I think so. Yeah, thank you for that comment. Also like the, the ideas in that statement that follows the question. Um, I, don't, I don't know precisely how to answer it other than not, not all scientists want to work with our collaborative. We've, we've approached a lot of people and it, it does, it kind of takes a special scientist to be involved. Um, and probably the, like the main quality is humility, like to, to sort of recognize that it's going to be a mess and recognize that you are not going to know the answer but that's part of why we're there in the room together. Um, and that's really counter to how academics are supposed to be, right? <laughs> um, so that, that's yeah. been part of it as well. Um, I don't know if that to Totally 100%, it wasn't a question, so really, so. <laughs> Next person, sorry, it's not as much. Oh, I'm lost, I was scrolled up. Colton, go ahead, <laughs> you're next. Hey Kelly, um, thanks for presenting your work. Um, I definitely appreciate uh, hearing your perspectives from doing like science art collaboration. Um, and it's exciting that that's led you to a lot of good places. Um, I'm curious, you kind of mentioned it earlier with the plastic conglomerates, how there's this like tendency to be like, oh, nature's taking care of itself. And like, maybe we don't have to like worry about this problem and like pushing back against that to still have, you know, like plastic pollution is a very urgent issue because it's contributing to like uh, biodiversity collapse and ecosystem collapse and like our own health. But at the same time, there are natural processes that are like sedimenting and fossilizing plastic. And like, it that seems like something not to ignore either. Um, so that, that just, I'm curious if that's something you've been like navigating in your research or in your work specifically is like balancing this thing. of like, we're causing this big problem. We need to address this problem, but also the earth is alive and has its own immune response system, similar to climate change. And the earth like will eventually deal with some of the shit we're throwing at it, but on a like vastly different time scale. But it like, I don't know, it seems like easy to ignore the agency that earth has but at the same time acknowledging that like makes the problem less of an issue um, yeah no I, I see the difference in you that. um i mean in terms of trying to get as many species to survive for as long as possible um this problem is the scale the, the earth isn't processing anything fast enough and i know there's a lot mm -hmm. of good news stories about like those grubs that are now eating the styrofoam, but those grubs are not eating the styrofoam fast enough. <laughs> there is way too much styrofoam. Um, so there's, you know, and we need good news stories to get out of bed in the morning. Um, but yeah, there's there's a real 
the pace, the pace of the earth, which is, of course, we are just a little blip. Hum the history of humans is just a little bit blip on the history of the earth. Um, Yeah. <laughs> cool. And then we've got Doug. Go ahead, Doug. Hi, Kelly. Nice to see you again. I wanted to say, yeah, I wanted to say hi and congratulations on everything that you're doing. Uh, yeah, I have, I guess, a bit of a question just to keep it in our context here uh, in the art department and that you're an alumni and yeah, interested in how your practice has developed over the years. Uh, but I guess I'm curious, just if you don't mind just talking a little bit about, uh, you know, kind of being the artist and the role of the artist and how you kind of envisioned that back when you were at school and kind of going through, you know, the undergrad and, and graduate programs and, you know, the relationship between doing research and working with materials and connecting it to kind of the issues out there in the world. And then what that's like for you now, like this, this kind of many years after and the depth of uh, projects that you've got and that kind of reach, like what's, how would you kind of see that, that difference? Hmm. Um, that's a fun thing to think about. Um, I can tell you what, what's the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the same is something, you know, I think something since I first got into art is just like, are you kidding me? This can be art. Like art can be art can be so many things. Art is so adaptable. Um, art is so constantly plugged into the absolute current moment, or it has that capacity to be, um, and to be even beyond what we know we need from it yet. Um, and I think I I had that then as a fresh-eyed first-year MFA, and I still have that now. Of like I just. I mean, of course, there's all sorts of gross things about art, Jeff Koons, blah, blah, blah. Um, but there's so much potential there, too. I'm so interested in the potential of what it can be. Um, yeah, very good. Maybe the difference is just my perception of time now. <laughs> it was, it just felt like looking back on my MFA, it just felt like I was just like drinking coffee and looking at bunnies all the time and thinking about my right. art, making massive works in the studio. Oh, good, good days. Those were days. Like, do you see that the role of artist is any different now, or, or do you just envision it differently? Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. I think it's always, it's always evolving. I mean, often when I tell people I'm involved in art science research, I kind of get an eye roll, and the sort of assumption mm -hmm. is like, oh, right, you're like illustrating science because there's grant money there. Um, mm -hmm. But I and and there is, it's true. But I think. I'm, just, I'm, I'm very beholden to, to still making good art, e even though there's this collaborative process. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll end. Thank you. Uh, yeah. A lot of bunny talk in the chat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I've lost it and I'll find it. Liam, go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Am I coming through? Yep. Okay, sweet. I'm sorry, I don't have a, a camera on this computer. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak to sort of any similarities that you've noticed between um, sort of like how an artistic practice can sort of balance itself out and look after all of the sort of different parts of it through sort of this holistic or more ecological framework. And if you've noticed similarities between that and, and you're thinking about sort of the environment and if, if some parallels can be drawn between like researching ways to sort of engage the human experience with the environment by like looking at the artistic experience because in so much of my history it feels like this this more holistic approach to being because you're in such communication with the material that you're using as we would imagine and hope that our, our society could be in communication with the environment around it yeah, yeah that's that's, that, that's a that's a really nice idea um I, yeah, I mean, again, I think art is capable of this. I think it's really interesting, all this uh, talk about object-oriented ontology and animism, and again, ideas that are like very closely paralleled uh, to many Indigenous worldviews. Um, but I do, I do think just, and this is going to sound like a cliche, but just how art just slows you down for a damn second to think about mm -hmm. something. Um, 
I, I think is so important and can't be can't be undervalued. That it's kind of more about the aesthetics, you know, and then a lot of meaning can be put on those aesthetics, you know, and we need that meaning to care about the environment. But it doesn't really matter what it's like initially about. It's just that like you care about it kind of. Is, mm -hmm. that, is it that sort of idea that you take the time to like really care about something? I think that's really a powerful idea. Yeah, yeah I, I often feel, um, and I, I think I feel like this teaching too, where to be an artist, you have to have your like sensors of the world turned up really high. And that is this like superpower because you're really, you're literally seeing a lot of things, but it's also, it also can be this weakness because, you know, once, you know, it's like the Star Trek thing where you, you increase your sensors so you can find new life, but then new life can find you in intense ways and you can, you know, it can be overwhelming. Um, so it's, yeah, trying to like, trying to find that balance. And I, I, especially in this research, I do like some of it is just so uh, deeply depressing. And, you know, I've, I've got my artist observation skills cranked to 11 so I can really see it. But at the same time, I, oof, I can feel vulnerable from that, from that process. So I think that's also like a, a training that I'm putting myself through inadvertently. And uh, providing a path for moving forward too, you know, through your shoes, your the way that you made to sort of empathize, you know, right. the tree breaking trail, I think is really important activity to do. Uh, thank you, fantastic answer. I think that's it, uh, unless anyone has a last question. If you do just type in the chat or a question in the chat. If not, um, thank you. Oh, Cedric's got a comment. Or Sabrina. No, no, uh, no real question. Uh, just saying, I wanted to say hi from Nate. He couldn't make it tonight. Oh, tell Nate I say hello. I, I included his photo credit in that first image. I saw that. I told him. He said he's made it. He's made the big time now. <laughs> so I uh, just wanted him to, uh, he wanted to say hi. It's his kid's 10th birthday tonight. So unfortunately, you came up second best. No, I, I expect to, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, though. It was a great talk. Thank you. Nice to see the work. We do have one last question, and it's from Emily. Hi. Um, in terms of being a science like artist, I guess you could say a, of terms, um, what do you have any recommendations as per contacting scientists and like how to go about that because I have like kind of a 50 50 sometimes on getting a response. <laughs> yes, I have I have some tips for you. <laughs> um, and a petition I get asked this a lot like just how did you two end up working with each other and I think I think what and I'm not saying that you've done this, but I think what what artists often do is they kind of have a pretty much formed idea, but they need like some fact checking and fixing by a scientist or an engineer or something. And so they approach them with the, the proposal of collaborating. And to a researcher who looks at an idea that's pretty much already there, that just sounds like work to them. So it's trying to find that starting point where you're piquing the curiosity of the scientist at like from, from zero at the same place that you are at zero. So you can grow together in dialogue and conversation. Um, if, if you are looking for another strategy and you're like, oh, but my idea is really good and I just need a scientist to be in there, then I would suggest approaching a grad student because they uh, also know a lot um, and are often really uh, open to just like kind of out of the blue proposals for things. And I've, okay. I worked, um, at the, the scientist that was uh, separating the microplastics in that video, um, it was a grad student and she like just an amazing superpower grad student who had invented this manual way of separating microplastics through a microscope. They look like pliers, but they're in fact tiny little tweezers. And she, like she was just doing the labor of with her body separating that, that act. And um, that, like that was the most special thing I've seen in any of my scientists collaborations is with that, that young, I think she was like 23 at the time, young person.